This is NBC News special coverage of the Republican National Convention. Live from Milwaukee, here is Tom Yamas. And tonight we are live from Milwaukee as the second night of the Republican National Convention kicks into high gear. You can see the stage right behind me as the arena filled with thousands excited for another evening with party leaders set to make their case for former President Trump. Taking a live look up look close at the convention stage will bring you notable speeches live in this hour as they happen. Tonight's theme is making America safe once again. Conversations centered around the former president's hardline stance on immigration and border security. And issue polls show time and time Time again is top priority for many Americans this election. In just moments, several Republican Senate candidates campaigning in key races are slated to speak. Many of them are either challenging sitting Democrats or open seats once held by Democrats. We'll also hear from former Trump rival Nikki Haley. Haley, who once thought it would be her accepting this nomination, now publicly urging others to throw their support behind the former president. Will she get a warm welcome or face a jeering crowd? Haley isn't the only former Trump opponent turned advocate speaking this evening. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy will make their way to the stage tonight. Other big names include Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Ted Cruz, and also gone from friend to foe of the former president. Closing out the evening is RNC chair, co-chair, and Trump's daughter-in-law, Mara Trump. Though crime and the borders are the issue tonight, some of those high-profile remarks will likely focus on the assassination attempt on former President Trump's life. And we're just learning Vice President Harris and Trump's running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, have spoken, potentially about a vice presidential debate. So how will the two fare against each other if that debate happens? Our reporters are fanned out across the convention floor this evening. We have a lot to get to on this very busy second night of the convention. For more on what we can expect, I'm going to bring in our political pros tonight, Mark Short. He's a former chief of staff to Vice President Mike Pence and a Meet the Press contributor. And Steve Hayes, he's editor and CEO of The Dispatch and an NBC News political analyst. And Michael Starr Hopkins, a Democratic strategist who worked on the Hillary Clinton and Obama campaign. We thank you all for being here, and just before we get started with some of the biggest minds in politics, we are going to go back down to the stage. Harry Lake, a candidate for uh, Senate in Arizona, is about to speak. Let's listen in. This is electric. Hello, America. Welcome, everybody who's watching at home. And welcome, everybody, in this great arena tonight. We love you all. Actually, actually, wait a minute. I don't mean that. I don't welcome everybody in this meeting, you, in this room. The guys up in the fake news, frankly, You guys up there in the fake news have worn out your welcome, right? You've worn it out, guys. You have spent the last eight years lying about President Donald Trump and his, and his amazing patriotic supporters. Actually, guys, they lie about everything. They've lied about Joe Biden's health, the economy, the laptop, the border. I could go on and on and on. But the really good news is that every day more and more people are turning off the fake news. And they're... That's right. And Americans are waking up to the truth about the disastrous Democrat policies pushed by Joe Biden and his favorite congressman, my opponent, Ruben Gallego. These guys, they are full, they're full of bad ideas. Just last week, Ruben Gallego voted to let the millions of people who poured into our country illegally cast a ballot in this upcoming election. (laughs) 
Gallego and the Democrats have handed over control of my state, Arizona's border, to the drug cartels. And because of them, criminals and deadly drugs are pouring in and our children are dying. Our children are getting their hands on these drugs and dying. I'll tell you, the hardest thing I've had to, I've had to do on the campaign trail is talk to moms and dads who come up to me and tell me that their 19-year-old son has died because of fentanyl poisoning, or their 22-year-old daughter took a half a pill and she's gone. We are losing a generation of young people to this fentanyl crisis, and it's got to stop. The Grand Canyon State has become the fentanyl state, and it's not okay with this mom. I'm not okay with that. I don't think it's okay with that mom. I don't think it's okay with that mom. It doesn't have to be this way. The problems we face are huge. The problems caused by the Democrat Party. But the solutions, guys, they're really simple. First of all, stop the Biden invasion and build the wall. Easy. Bidenomics to the curb and bring back the Meganomics? Is that okay? I miss the strong Trump economy. And because I'm a mama bear, I, I want to replace this indoctrination, this psychological abuse they're inflicting on our children with a real, solid, quality education. It's all common sense. The great news is that we can solve these problems, and, and to be honest, we must solve these problems for the sake of our children, because that's really what this is all about, right? The next generation, the future of our country. I learned something watching, you know, the, the Nature Channel, that the most dangerous place on planet Earth is between a mama bear and her baby cubs, right? And that's exactly where the radical left have found themselves, and it's not going to go well for them, because guess what? They have awoken a sleeping giant. Tens of millions of moms and dads from sea to shining sea, they're going to show up on November 5th, and they're going to be hearing from us on November 5th. That's right. Actually, I, 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 think, I, I can think of one thing more dangerous than a grizzly bear, and it's a middle-aged, fed-up mother in Washington, D.C. And I haven't even started my hot flashes yet, guys. Just wait. Just wait. But seriously, I, I want every mother and father to know this, that we, the Republican Party, will fight. I will fight, not just for my kids and my daughters over here. Are you over there, Ruby? Wave to me. Wave to mom. My daughters over there, I, I want to fight for, selfishly, I want to fight for my kids, but I want to fight for your kids as well. They deserve a better future. They deserve a better future. But the really good news here, and the, and the fake news won't, the, the fake news wants us to believe we're 50-50 at each other's throat. They're creating division and anger. Americans are actually much more united than people believe. Right? You see it. We see it. We want to make life better, and we want to create an incredible future for this generation and the next generation. And together, when we join together, we will make America safe again, and we will make America great again. God bless all of you here tonight. God bless you, America, and God bless President Donald J. Trump. I love you guys. Thank you. You just, you just heard Arizona Senate candidate, and I should mention former TV news anchor, Harry Lake speak right there at the RNC. Lake is on pace for a landslide win in the Republican primary against her opponent, Mark Lamb. She's up 25 points in a poll from May. She closely trails a presumptive Democratic nominee, Ruben Gallego, in one poll from Junius. For more on Carrie Lake's remarks in the Republican primary just two weeks away, I want to get right over to NBC correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. So, Vaughn, with the primary so close, why has Carrie Lake chosen to speak at the RNC. Welcome to Wisconsin! 
his Trump in the heels. And in 2022, when she narrowly lost that race for governor, she really became Donald Trump's favorite go-to acolyte. She was somebody who left the news industry, ran for political office after nearly three decades on local airwaves. She came up just short, though, which was notable in the longtime red state, conservative state of Arizona. And a large part of that was because her conversations that I had with reticent Republicans and independents was the election denialism. And she was insistent that Donald Trump won the election. And ever since she narrowly lost that race for governor in 2022, she has claimed the exact same thing happened with her race in 2022. And now she is running for the U.S. Senate against Ruben Gallego, somebody who, if a couple years ago you talked to most Democrats, they said Ruben Gallego wouldn't have ever had a shot statewide in Arizona. He was a Bernie Sanders acolyte, a progressive. And now those two are in a head-to-head -head matchup in very tight polling. Arizona suddenly has voted for a Democrat for the U.S. Senate three election cycles in a row. It voted for Joe Biden in 2020. And in talking with longtime Republicans in that state, they say that this is the election cycle where they need to turn things around. And for Carrie Lake, if she were to get to Capitol Hill, she, as you just heard, she's an effective speaker for the MAGA Republican cause. And when you talk to Republicans, they want her up on Capitol Hill because they believe she can effectively convey the message not only of Donald Trump, but also of his Republican Party. The question is, can she pull it off? If you look at her position on abortion just two years ago, Tom, it's sort of been a shift, much like that of the Republican Party, even Donald Trump. She was somebody who had suggested that there should be an all-out ban on abortion when she was running for governor. Now, she said that it is a decision that should be left up to voters, and it is Arizona voters that are going to be able to vote on a proposition this upcoming November on whether women's reproductive rights will be codified into state law. And so, really, Carrie Lake's story is also the story of the Republican Party and that of Donald Trump. And the big question here is, in the next three and a half months, can she make up that difference and beat the progressive Democrat, Ruben Gallego? All right. Von Hilliard, we appreciate your report. I want to bring it back now to our political pros. Uh, Mark, I'm going to start with you. How, how does she fit into sort of the Republican messaging of turning the temperature down? It seems like she, she, she'd like to throw a couple, couple bombs right there when she started. Well, I think it's notable she's not in prime time, but I also think that, look, not only was she a former journalist, she's a two-time Obama neighborhood canvasser. And yeah. so uh, I, I think the reality is my old boss used to say, we, we welcome converts, but you don't put them in the pulpit on the first Sunday. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, her messaging really is, 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 is helpful tonight. She's been loyal to, to former President Trump, Stephen Hayes. Does she have a chance to win Arizona? I mean, I think she has a chance. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the top of the ticket imbalance right now that you're seeing between Donald Trump's popularity and Joe Biden, I think, flagging uh, at this moment may may benefit her. But look, she, she's a, a great speaker. She's a rock star. She appeals to this crowd. But what's her appeal beyond this crowd? I think that's the real question. And she says things like, you know, the, the mainstream media is lying and he, she takes her shots and this crowd loves it. She's the one who's still claiming that she won in 2022, that Donald Trump won in 2020. It's time to move and I want to say some people were clapping, maybe a lot of people were clapping when she attacked the news media, but I can say from our, our experience so far here, people have been incredibly welcoming down there. Agreed. People have been incredibly polite, and, and I haven't heard one... I haven't really heard anything negative but until that just happened right there. Um, Steve, I do want to ask you, you're, you're, you're somebody who still has not bought in to former President Donald Trump. You haven't been afraid to write about that and to criticize him. I, I do want to ask you, what do you think is going to happen when Nikki Haley takes the stage? What do you hope she says? It's a good question, and I, to be honest, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I think, on the one hand, I've heard, I've talked to some delegates, I've talked to some people here who are enthusiastic that she's here, that she's willing to come, that she threw her delegates to Donald Trump, that she seems to be getting back on the team. So she could be rewarded with some applause. Uh, there. I, I expect we that she will, will give a full-throated endorsement. I don't think there's going to be a half-step or she wouldn't be here. It'll be quite a contrast from the way that she ended her campaign and the way she campaigned for most of the time, but, you know, Nikki Haley is, uh, to be polite about it, been sort of on every side of Donald Trump over the course of her career, over the course of this election cycle. I would expect she'll give a, a big endorsement. To It'll be interesting to see how they, they receive her tonight. It's a whole team of rivals. Michael, I, I do want to get to you and talk about the Democrats. Um, our Lester Holt had a great interview yesterday with President Biden. It was a tough interview. He was on the defensive at moments during that interview. Uh, well, how do you read the president's quote-unquote comeback tour since the last debate? Is, is, he, is he winning? Is he gaining back voters? Is he gaining back the Democratic Party? 
I mean, the president's game all along has been to run out the clock. And so what you're seeing is a president who's certainly going to push back. Uh, he's certainly giving himself opportunities to go in front of the media. Uh, but voters know who they're voting for at this point. And voters also understand that they're not just voting for the top of the ticket. They're voting all the way down. And so when Republicans put up candidates who are anti-choice, anti-birth control, anti-IVF, you know, are literally putting our government up for sale, it makes it easier for Democrats who are wary of President Biden to still support the entire ticket. Legally. Uh, we're going to dip back in. A Senate candidate uh, from the state of Ohio, Bernie Moreno, is speaking right now. Let's take a listen. To live in a country where they could achieve anything, I will forever be grateful to them. I love America, and I've lived the American dream. I married my best friend, raised a family, built successful businesses, and created thousands of jobs for hardworking Americans. But the American dream that I lived is under attack from Joe Biden and his enablers in the Senate, like Sherrod Brown. They have encouraged millions of illegals to invade America. And Joe Biden's border czar, Kamala Harris, and the Democrat Senate have put the welfare of illegals ahead of our own citizens. They've destroyed our border. They've destroyed our economy. They've destroyed our standing in the world. And they'll destroy America if we don't stop them. In November, we will fire Biden and Harris, and we will re-elect President Donald J. Trump. I'm so proud that my senator, my friend, J.D. Vance, will be the next vice president of the United States. He represents the best of Ohio, the best of America, and will be an incredible leader and defender of President Trump's plan to always put America first. And he won't stop there. Sherrod Brown votes with Biden virtually 100 percent of the time. I don't know if I agree with my wife 100 percent of the time. But Sherrod and Joe seem to have a very close relationship. Well, tonight, we've got a message for failed, lifelong politicians like Sherrod Brown and Joe Biden. It's time to go home. A vote for Trump and Marino is a vote to put America first. We will end the invasion at our southern border. We will fix our economy, protect American workers, and rescue America's family from Biden's and Brown's inflation. We will end the wars and deliver peace. I will fight alongside Donald Trump to make America stronger, safer, and more prosperous. Thank you, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. We've just been listening to Ohio Republican Senate candidate Bernie Moreno locked in a very tough race against the Democratic incumbent there, Sherrod Brown. It went from a 10-point race to a 5-point race in recent polls, so he's definitely gained some ground, but no doubt uh, it's going to be a tough race for him. But if former President Trump and Senator J.D. Vance win this election, there's the possibility that Moreno could lose that election and then be appointed by Governor DeWine in the long run, but we can't get too ahead of ourselves. I want to bring back our political pros. Mark, I want to start with you. So the, the, the news that we we have that NBC News has confirmed is that Vice President Kamala Harris has had a conversation with Senator J.D. Vance. If you were advising Senator J.D. Vance like you advised former Vice President Mike Pence, would you tell him to debate? And the reason why I ask this is because obviously Democrats have some, some ground to gain and the ball seems to be in Republicans' court for now. Does he need to debate her? I think he should. I think the reality is he owes it to the American people, but I also think that J.D. Vance is a very skilled debater. I think he's, he's very quick. That was part of the argument, right? For 
for him to join the ticket because Trump apparently was impressed with the way he could debate. I think Trump likes having him out as a surrogate. I think he likes him sparring on many cases with mainstream media. And I think that he would he would fare well in a debate with uh, the vice president. So I think I think it would be in his interest to do that. Yeah. Steve Hayes, you know, a, a lot of the, the topics and the subjects of this convention are unity, right? And, and I've talked to a lot of people who say this is the most unified they've seen the Republican Party. Even Speaker Kevin McCarthy said that, former speaker who's no longer the speaker, not even in Congress. Uh, I, I want to ask you, because you're somebody who has been part of that sort of never Trump wing at times. Do you think the party is the most united it's ever been? And Mark's here laughing as well. I want to I get Mark's think after that, but do you think the party's the most united it's been? I do. I mean, and I think that the pick of J.D. Vance makes it so, right? I mean, this is, this, I would say this isn't sort of doubling down on MAGA. J.D. Vance is MAGA plus. He wants to go further than Donald Trump in a lot of different policy areas. He comes from sort of this, this new right intellectual world that spawns all of these ideas, calls this a post-liberal uh, republic now, and, and I think he will be a force in the Trump administration pushing the president to go even further. There's just not, you know, you can still have conversations with people, I know Mark does this too, sen sitting senators, sitting representatives who will talk to me and talk about how they still favor free trade, they want tax cuts, they favor uh, American influence abroad. They just don't want to say it out loud, and they don't want to say it in front of cameras. So until that moment, until they're willing to do that and actually have the argument, which is not going to be anytime soon, it's Trump's party. Why were you laughing? Well, I think that, look, I think Joe Biden unifies the Republican Party. I think Donald Trump unifies the Democrat Party. They both are still in the low 40s, you know? So it, it, I think it's it's everybody's job here is to tell you that we're a unified party. But as I said, I, it's hard for me to think of a time when there's a greater assault on conservatism than there was last night at our GOP uh, convention on, on somebody telling telling us that job creators or corporate pigs, somebody telling us that NATO caused the invasion of Putin invading Ukraine, of, of speakers who I, I think up and down the, the rostrum were not basically honoring conservative values. And you look at the platform, it certainly walked away from that too. And so then you, 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 you have the number two on the ticket who wants to essentially, he said, he's been quoted as saying, I, he doesn't really care about Ukraine. And, and you have a lot of people in this room that do care about Ukraine. So so I think it's, it's a messaging to say you're unified. We'll see how, how last Last night ends up playing out as we move past the convention. Michael, uh, the, the split screen to all of this, though, is that you have a Republican Party that says it is completely united behind former President Trump, and then you have Democrats, right? And you have all that reporting that's coming out today uh, about people like uh, Representative Adam Schiff talking to donors. You have several Democrats that have come out publicly. You have people going on background with reporters saying they don't want President Biden to be the nominee. How ununified do you think is the Democratic Party right now? You know, I, I think it's a weird juxtaposition because we're resigned to the fact that Joe Biden is going to be the nominee, whether or not we believe that he gives us the best chance to win the White House. But what we know is that retaining the Senate and uh, winning the House is really where we're going to be able to put a check on Trump should Republicans have a good night. Like, Democrats cannot be apologetic about uh, executing the case. This is a... a Everything's at stake here, and it, it almost feels like Democrats aren't taking the moment seriously. Michael, great to talk to you guys. Uh, Mark, Stephen, also great. Stand by for us. We're about to take you guys live to the convention floor. I want to set up the next speaker. It's Senate candidate David McCormick of Pennsylvania. He was actually on the stage with former President Trump during that uh, attempted assassination that happened on Saturday. They were speaking in western P Pennsylvania, in Butler County. Uh, it, it was a rally filled with thousands of people uh, up until that moment where that shooter, uh, Thomas Matthew Crooks, decided to pull the trigger and fire a bullet into the crowd, killing a Trump supporter, a father who's trying to protect his family, injuring two others that were at the rally. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of mayors. I've spoken to local leaders who were there. They describe the situation as completely chaotic, a situation that in many ways has changed them because they couldn't believe what they just saw. From what we saw from former President Trump, it may have changed him as well. We saw him walking with that bandage over his ear. And many people I've talked to said that when he walked in there, he looked like someone different, or at least somebody that the, the moment was weighing on him, and, and why wouldn't it, right? He, he almost died. He was almost murdered. Uh, let's let's tune in. Let's go down now to the campaign. Let's see. The convention stage. Yeah, he started to speak. Who's let's look at it. Who's ready to retire Joe Biden and borders are Kamala Harris and send her back to California? Who's ready for that? And who's ready to make Donald Trump our 47th president? Are you ready for that? And who's ready to make J.D. Vance our new vice president?
And who's ready to send Chuck Schumer packing? I'm ready. I'm ready. My name is Dave McCormick, and I'm running to be the Pennsylvania's next United States Senator, the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I want to first acknowledge what transpired just a few days ago in my home state, where I witnessed firsthand from a front row seat in Butler President Trump's remarkable strength and resolve in a terrifying, terrifying and unpredictable moment. The President rose brilliantly to the challenge, but what a sad, sad and frightening day for the families of those who were injured or lost and for our great country. And we all thank God that President Trump is okay. I'm a seventh generation Pennsylvanian from the great Keystone State, born and raised. A West Point graduate, a former Army wrestler. I'm a combat veteran of the 82nd Airborne Division. All right, 82nd. And I'm a business leader who helped create hundreds of jobs in Western Pennsylvania. But most important, I'm a dad to six daughters, and I'm a husband to the love of my life, Dina, wherever she is. Now, now my opponent's name is Bob Casey. But you probably don't know him because he does nothing. For 18 years, Bob Casey has been warming a chair and drawing a paycheck. He is a do-nothing, out-of-touch, liberal career politician. And when he votes, he votes for Joe Biden's tired old ideas. Casey's been around so long, so long that the number one song when he was first elected was the Macarena, right? Does everybody remember the Macarena? But sadly, this is no joke, because politics is about choices. And the policies of Biden and Bob Casey are dangerous for Pennsylvania and America. They won't keep us safe. Drugs have poured across the Biden-Harris-Casey wide open borders, killing 100,000 Americans, including 4,000 Pennsylvanians, last year alone. Illegal immigrants have victimized innocent young women who could easily be your daughter or mine. And time again, Casey has voted for pro-criminal judges who have made our streets across Pennsylvania more dangerous. Biden and Casey's failed policies have crushed working families with sky-high prices for gas and groceries and rent and regulations to kill Pennsylvania natural gas. Under President Trump, America's was future was strong and prosperous and our adversaries feared stepping out of line. My friends, the choice this November is clear. It's a choice between strength and weakness. A choice between America's greatness or its sad, disgraceful decline. This is, my friends, the most important election of our lifetimes. And we deserve a president and a Senate that will go to the mat to fight for America. A president and a Senate that will unite America. And in Pennsylvania, that means voting for Trump and McCormick in November. Thank you all for leading the charge. God bless our United States of America. We were just listening there to David McCormick, the Republican nominee for Senate in Pennsylvania. As I mentioned, he literally had a front row seat to Saturday's assassination attempt against former President Trump. In his speech, he took shots at his opponent, Democrat incumbent Senator Bob Casey. Right now, Casey ahead by just about six percentage points. But to be clear, the polls in this race have been all over the place. So even though this race, this, this poll here shows a, a close race, there have been polls that show this race could be a little bit more wide. For more, Dasha Burns joins us now live with the Pennsylvania 
Pennsylvania delegation. She's down on the floor. Dasha, the race between McCormick and Casey, it's set to become the most expensive Senate race this election cycle. McCormick's campaign reported he raised more than $8 million. But I guess the big question is, how does that assassination attempt affect this race? Look, Tom, I think it affects every down-ballot race, but particularly the one in Pennsylvania. You know, I actually covered McCormick in the Pennsylvania primary during the midterms in 2022. He's a very different candidate now, uh, more experienced, more polished, and now has experienced this tragic event firsthand. He was sitting in the front row. I just spoke to his wife, Dina, who, of course, served in the Trump administration. She uh, wasn't there with him, but told me how much new resonance this speech and his presence here and the presence of the Pennsylvania delegation has taken on in, in the wake of, of that attack and in the wake of the former president's reaction to it. He mentioned it in his speech, and it's something that is likely going to be uh, informing his campaign and how he talks and how so many of these down ballot candidates uh, talk about this current political moment, Tom. You know, it, it, this is kind of an interesting race, right, because former President Trump has given his endorsement, but but he and McCormick have a very strange relationship, right, because McCormick wasn't part of that wing of the Republican Party that was saying the election was stolen, correct? That's right, and in fact, in the pri primary, uh, Trump in endorsed his primary rival, a bitter primary r rival, Dr. Oz, and so that relationship had some strain, but clearly now, uh, as today's theme, of course, it's make America we've been hearing from sources is that today they really wanted to send a message of unity given uh, all of what's transpired and given that folks like Nikki Haley and Governor Ron DeSantis are going to be speaking tonight who were of course primary rivals of the former president so today they're trying to paint the picture and send the message of the Republican Party all getting on the same page Tom. Dasha you got some dancing delegates behind you there any chance we could hear from them what do they think about that Senate race? Absolutely. A lot of dancing, bands playing, people have been moving and grooving here today. I want to uh, introduce you to Stacy. We were actually just chatting, chatting earlier today. Uh, Stacy, what did you think of, of the speech that Dave McCormick just gave and this moment particularly for Pennsylvania? Well, listen, it only seems fitting to me that Pennsylvania was the birthplace of our nation's democracy. And now we have an incredible opportunity with Dave McCormick to make sure that we take back our Senate and make sure that Pennsylvania is responsible for saving our country from from the brink of disaster, quite frankly. Pennsylvania is front and center here on the floor. Pennsylvania has also been front and center in the news because of this weekend's events. What does this moment mean to you and this celebratory mood here today in the aftermath of something so tragic? You know, it really was tragic. And uh, I'm an Army veteran, so it was... It, Thank you for your service. Uh, oh, my honor. Um, and so I, I think it was really unifying because we all feel that it was divine intervention that saved Trump for you know for a higher purpose and that's to save our country. Stacy, thank you so much. There you have it. Unity mentioned yet again it's a message that uh, Republicans are trying to push today. Tom? Da Dasha Burns from the convention floor. Dasha, always appreciate your reporting. We're going to have much more ahead tonight from night two of the RNC. Immigration taking center stage as the evening focuses on the border. How the party is presenting the issue that is top of mind for voters. Our live coverage from Milwaukee continues right here on NBC News Now. I think it really comes down to the fact that I, in a primary, I do think he's He's the most positioned to win when it comes down to the general election. Check that date right there, November 15th, 2022. That was Abraham Enriquez, who was on my show nearly two years ago, the day former President Trump announced he was running for president again. Abraham joins us again now. He's the founder and president of Bienvenido U.S. and a supporter of Donald Trump. And and. Abraham, we should tell the viewers what happened. I was on the convention floor yesterday, and you pulled me, and you said, I was on your show, and I told you that Donald Trump was going to be the nominee again, and everybody said I was wrong. There was a whole panel, and there was, a, there was a whole party that was looking for people like Governor Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley or Senator Tim Scott, but you were right. What do you think happened? Why, why do you think former President Trump and, and all these Republican voters came back to him? Yeah, well, what a full circle moment to be here with you, Tom. And uh, what happened? Well, I think that... 
I think the DC consulting class uh, has lost touch with the millions of particularly Hispanic voters um, and realizing that President Trump hit a chord with Hispanic voters. And you and I both know that when you put a leader in front of the Hispanic community, they're very loyal to that leader. And so going into his reelection or his uh, announcement for his reelection campaign, I knew from the start that he had welcomed and given a big bienvenido to millions of new voters into the party. And they were going to let that go so easily. And we see that here today. Are you, are you frustrated that he didn't try to sort of expand the ticket, maybe expand expand the tent for the Republican Party with a pick like Senator Marco Rubio, who could go into Hispanic communities. He can go in Telemundo, Univision, speak directly to voters in their native languages. And he went with Senator J.D. Vance, who, who may be a, a junior version of Donald Trump. Well, look, I think he actually did uh, expand the, the, the ticket to reach Hispanic voters with J.D. Vance. Let me tell you why. Uh, we often forget that the average age of Hispanics in America are 29 years old, meaning we're the youngest racial demographic in the country. Uh, J.D. Vance is, I think, will be the youngest vice president that we have in over 70 years. That and also two-thirds of Hispanics on the voter roll, Tom, are second and third generation Hispanics, meaning that we are assimilating to American culture better. English is our first language. Most of us have a college degree, and we care more about the issues about the economic policies that are put into place rather than be just lumped in on immigration talks like maybe my grandparents or parents did yeah. when they were coming into the party. Democrats have historically always gained more Hispanic voters, always gotten a larger share of the Hispanic vote when it comes to presidential elections and really elections across the country, with the exception of some pockets like South Florida. I, I do want to ask you, what do you think is happening with President Biden and Hispanic voters? Because polling has shown that, that Donald Trump has, has been able to peel away some support. It all comes down to policies, Tom. I mean, today's theme of the convention is uh, make America safe again. Under President Tr uh, Biden, we've seen a 44 percent increase in crime from 2021 to 2022. He has seen he has been over two uh, of, the, uh, of the, the most murderous years try to three of the most murderous years that we've seen in the last quarter century when crime and safety are on the top three issues that Hispanics care about they're gonna start looking at how they live their life under the Trump administration and maybe are able to divorce the candidate from the party and select the candidate that's gonna make this country safe again. President Biden has made some inroads though what it, what it, it's really you know when you say crime you, you could also talk about states individually and governors but the FBI has come out with a report saying that crime is down in major big cities. Uh, and then with, when it comes to immigration, there have been some inroads made with Mexico. There's now interdictions in the southern part of that state and uh, country, I should say. In Panama, they're adding razor wire to the Darien Gap. It's not a perfect uh, fix or solution, but it's, it's helping bring numbers down. My question to you is those issues affect uh, Hispanics. They're important to them just because like they're important to, to all Americans. But is it too late? Has it been three years uh, uh, where the numbers weren't in, in President Biden's favor? And now that they may be sort of trending in that direction, it's too late. It's not really just too late. I think President Biden has relied on out-of-touch Hollywood elites to get out the vote for Hispanic voters. The fact that his main surrogate, Eva Longoria, couldn't even make it to one of his rallies. And on the flip side, let's talk about President Trump and what he's done with Hispanic That's outreach. That's an important point. You're saying they're not organizing enough when it comes to Hispanics? Not nearly enough. Are you kidding me? I think that they've just banked this idea that because we're Hispanic, we're going to immediately uh, tie to a party. When you and I both know that Hispanics, we're not loyal to a party, not even to a candidate. We're loyal to values. And those are consistent consistently talking about those values um, and have show support with the community are going to do great. I had the honor of organizing a stop at a cafecito shop in Miami with President Trump where he had a, a hundreds of Hispanics uh, talking about the policies that benefited to them when they met him. We can talk about his stop in, the, in, in a bodega in the Bronx in New York. We can talk about his rally that he had in a heavily Hispanic neighborhood in Las Vegas. And we can talk about when he came to my home state of Texas when he rolled up his sleeves and served the uh, Border Patrol agents, which are majority Hispanic. President Trump doesn't wait for the community to go to him. He goes to the community and shares the policies that uh, are going to benefit Hispanics and all American in general. Speaking of your, your home state of Texas, that's where I saw you in the delegation there yesterday. Senator Ted Cruz is going to speak tonight. He had a very different convention in 2016 when he came out and he said, vote your conscience. He's not going to say that now. He's, he's on better terms uh, with former President Trump. But he doesn't have a complete lock in that race. Do you think he wins the state of Texas? Absolutely. Yeah, you look at polling. He's, he's, he's doing pretty great. Um, I, I think it just comes down to the fact that uh, Texas has been leading in a lot of different areas, whether it's ec the economy. But it's Democrats have made inroads there, and they, they, they have made with candidates that, that have attracted attention and at times still a red state. I'm not saying it's a purple state like some have, have tried to claim, but the Democrats have made inroads. Should Republicans there be worried? 100%. They should, I, I, 
every every candidate, every campaign should be worried, especially because of the fact that uh, tr uh, Texas is now majority Hispanic, meaning sooner or later we're going to be the majority on the voting rolls in Texas. So if you don't start outreaching to our community today, you will lose Texas tomorrow. And I think having Senator Cruz understand that, visiting Hispanic churches, visiting Hispanic business leaders, and emphasizing more policies and what he's done to safeguard business and the economy in Texas is really going to help him in this election cycle. Abraham and Enrique, as you called it two years ago on Top Story Live, brought you back. Great to hear from you again. We appreciate it. We're going to have much more tonight from Milwaukee. Still ahead, the highly anticipated moment. Former Trump rival Nikki Haley set to speak this evening. What she's expected to say as several of Trump's former opponents unite to support him. Our special coverage continues right here on NBC News Now. Stay with us. We are back for the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. It is day two here, and we have heard from lawmakers, celebrities, and everyday people sharing why they support former President Trump and the Republican Party. Take a look at one of the speakers from last night. I realize Donald Trump and his supporters don't care if you're black, white, gay, or straight. It's all love. Here. That moment by model and actor Amber Rose reinforcing a part of the new GOP platform no longer explicitly opposing same-sex marriage, a shift from the party's traditional view. Joining us now is Charles Moran. He's president of the Log Cabin Republicans, the nation's largest GOP organization dedicated to representing LGBTQ plus conservatives. Charles, from your organization's perspective, how big uh, of a moment was this in the shift in language on the platform? Tom, this has been probably one of the most important things that's happened in the, in the Republican Party history, where we've really seen a modernization. And it shows that this new Republican Party, led by Donald Trump, has put his DNA into the party. This platform is welcoming. It's inclusive. This is the most radical and revolutionary way to make the Republican Party competitive in many years. The former First Lady Melania Trump had a fundraiser that you attended for your group, the Log Cabin Republicans. Um, I don't want to say a a couple years ago, but maybe maybe a decade ago, that, that might have been unheard of. Talk to me about why she, this is so important to her and what did she tell your group? I mean, I think the First Lady consistently talks about the term unity, and I think we've seen a lot of that language used at this convention and used by President Trump, bringing all Americans together. This isn't about putting people in little boxes and putting them one, against one another, and that's so much as what we see about American politics. Mrs. Trump is trying to get all of this country to come together to face our mutual challenges, and she sees um, supporting a group like ours and helping elevate our stature and our work is being able to help create a more perfect union. There have been groups that have, have serious concerns with some of the language that Senator J.D. Vance has used that it is homophobic. Sometimes there's language used here that, that people may interpret to be homophobic. Are, are, are you worried that maybe you're being accepted for your votes, but people don't, don't believe that you should actually be able to get married and they believe in the type of person you are? Well, I think Donald Trump has had a long history as a philanthropist and a businessman and now a politician is being supportive and inclusive. We've seen this shift in the Republican Party model that so that that's actually really important. But don't confuse a commitment to parental rights and, uh, you know, traditional biological gender issues as being something as homophobic. We know that, you know, it, most of this country agrees in protecting women's spaces, preserving women's sports, ensuring parental rights at every level, and really looking at the issue of gender transition under the age of 18. These are common sense issues. This isn't necessarily something that's, quote, homophobic. I think you're drawing a, a, an important distinction, but we should sort of walk our viewers through this because we have heard from this stage uh, several speakers that don't support transgender rights um, that say uh, kids who transition should not be playing in sports. Um, and, and is that what you're saying as well? Do you agree with that platform, even even though you, you, you're part of an LGBTQ group? Just because that you're gay doesn't necessarily mean that you're ignoring the inherent biology that somebody who is transgender is biologically different than somebody of the gender that they've changed to. This is just pure science, and it's common sense. You've got people like Caitlyn Jenner, who is a biological man, she's a transgender woman, who has stood up and said, I am somebody who, you know, competes against men because biologically that's where I was. This is, you know, you can't take the issues around, you know, 
politicization around things that are simple biology. And this is where, again, we've seen yeah. we've seen Joe Biden gut Title IX, one of the most important things for the women's rights movement, being thrown out the window for political expediency. Do you, do you agree the language, though, could, could maybe be toned down a little bit? You, you, you grew up a, a gay man. I'm, I'm sure that was not easy in America. You know what it's like to be called out or to be made fun of or to be ostracized, I would think. Um, when you hear some of the language here, though, does, does, does it make you say, maybe we should have a conversation, maybe we can deliver that message differently? Well, this is what we're doing in Log Cabin Republicans, is working with the Republican Party to message these things. What we're hearing on the stage today is conversations about parental rights, about liberty. And honestly, that's where J.D. Vance's focus has been. The things that the gay left are accusing him of being homophobic or transphobic, he's working with a legislation limitedly that he's introduced and some of the things he's talked about. It's about ensuring religious freedom. It's about ensuring liberty and ensuring the ability for parents to really have control over their kids' education. These aren't LGBT rights issues. These are just issues of surrounding freedom and liberty and taking back control from a government bureaucracy that wants to tell people how to live their lives. Did the First Lady say that the president, former President Trump, her husband, actually cares about these issues? Uh, we don't even need Mrs. Trump to tell us, as President Trump tells us that directly. I had a convening in Las Vegas of over the top 100 LGBT Republican leaders in my organization, and President Trump called in to talk to us directly. I don't need Melania to do that, yeah. but she, Melania is also, she's her own woman, and she talks about, you know, these values of inclusivity and freedom um, that she and the president both share. Mr. Brian, it's great to have you here. Thank you for sharing that. We appreciate you. Thanks so much. We are in... Night two of the Republican National Convention about to hit prime time. Big name speakers are slated to speak this evening. What we could hear from Senator Marco Rubio, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, and Senator Ted Cruz. Our live coverage from Milwaukee continues right after this. Oh, it's really, really, okay. We are back now with NBC News special coverage of the Republican National Convention. Tonight, we've got some big names addressing the convention, including multiple former Trump rivals and the RNC co-chair. Here with a look, this is a, a look of, of people that are speaking today and then later tonight. Here with a look ahead of these big moments, Tara Paul Marich, the senior political correspondent at Puck News and director of communications for Trump's 2020 campaign, Mark Lauder. Guys, thank you for being here. So, Tara, first up with you, you're one of the tenacious reporters mm -hmm. covering politics, especially the Republican Party. What are some big scoops you've been working on? Um, I think there's been a lot about this lineup has been, you know, the big story for the past few days. Who gets a spot? Who doesn't? What time? What time do, do they not? Um, you know, for example, Ron DeSantis was hanging in the balance for a while because of the rivalry between Trump and, uh, and, the, and the governor. Nikki Haley was just asked at the last minute. I spoke to her people on Thursday for a call on my road. I asked them what the story and they said well we haven't asked but we also haven't been invited and they haven't offered and so actually after trump faced this near-death experience he extended the invite to her um you know we have marco rubio who's obviously passed um for the Didn't get picked yeah and so he's got to go out there now and kind of swallow that after having to to, to really hear about the feelings though from some of these people like desantis like nikki hey like rubio I think they know they have to do this. If they want to be a part of the Republican Party, the future of the Republican Party, they have to go out there and they have to do this. I don't know what's going to happen when Nikki Haley comes out, right? I mean, she did win 20% of the GOP primary voter, but at the end of the day, um, there might be booze. Yeah. And that's what her people told me they were afraid of. Mark, I'm going to ask you that. What do you think happens? And, and how, if you were advising Nikki Haley, if she comes out here and the crowd boos her, how does she handle that? Because it can be embarrassing. Yeah, I think you have to know that that's going to happen when she walks on the stage. And I think you quickly state in your first within 30 seconds that you're pledging all of your support to Donald Trump and those boos will turn to cheers. What about Governor Ron DeSantis? Talk to me about the tightrope he's got to sort of balance. I think the same tightrope for both Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. If they have, I mean, they said some, some, some pretty terrible things ab about the nominee. Yeah, primaries happen. I mean, Kamala yeah. Harris called Joe Biden a racist and she's right. now vice president. So uh, th those are primaries. But if you want to have a future and look, we're not done with 2024 yet, so let's not start 2028, please. But just because JD's the nominee does not necessarily uh, for VP doesn't mean he's the nominee in 28. So I'm sure Nikki Haley, I'm sure Ron DeSantis, and many others are going to sit there and go, "We have to do this. Everyone in this arena, we need them come yeah. 2028." And so let's do the right thing by 2024, and we'll see where we are. Tara Puck has done a lot of reporting uh, about the behind the scenes with the Democratic Party and, and their issues right now with President Joe Biden. What's the sense from your reporters there? Does, does President Biden survive this? 
I mean, I, the, the talks are very fluid, but there's a feeling that they will pick up again. Um, Nancy Pelosi is sort of the maestro behind the scenes, kind of in like a you only live once kind of thinking and going out there and really trying to galvanize electeds because the feeling is that Biden will listen to elected leaders rather than uh, former President Barack Obama or perhaps even, you know, Bill Clinton, who might tell him to sit to step down because they've done so in the past. Um, and, you know, they, they realize they have a weak candidate. They would like to pick this back up again. They would like to they would like to convince him to move on. But you you've heard him yourself. He said that a train is the only way he'd be out of it, being hit by a train. Right. So it's going to take a lot of work. He did open the door to if he saw some data. It sounded like he said that during his, his news conference, that if he, if, he, if he saw some data, he, you know, he could essentially think about it. Those are my words, but that, that's what some people thought he was signaling. Boy, but if you open any newspaper in America, any of the public polling, it's all out there. You would have to shield your eyes not to see right. that data. Unless the Biden campaign is getting something completely different, but my reporting yeah. says they have the same as the public polling. So, Mark, you have the interview with ABC News. You have the news conference, right? You have the interview with Lester Holt where he was fiery. I mean, give me your honest take here. I mean, is his comeback tour, is it working? Because he is not collapsing like he was. And not that he physically collapsed, but, but he is not dropping the ball like he did at the debate. I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's going to change his answer or change his decision, but I don't think it's going to be enough to save him. When you look at the polls, and I'm not just looking at the, the, the battlegrounds today or the national averages today. Remember, four years ago and even eight years ago, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden were up by seven, eight points. Donald Trump is now up two, three, four points nationally and in the battlegrounds. That's an 11 point swing from an election that was decided by 43,000 yeah. votes in three states. That's massive. Tara, talk to me about some of the, the behind the scenes reporting on the relationship between Senator J.D. Vance and former President Trump. Are, are, are they really tight? Um, you know, the victors tend to write the narratives. And so he has he has won this victory. He is the he is the one who got chosen. All the stories have been glowing. Is it true? I mean, it took a while. It took two years, which is not that long when you think about it. But speaking of someone who said terrible things about former President I mean, Trump, seriously. So back in 2022, I'm sure you recall, he was in a Senate primary in Ohio. He was in third place, running out of cash, no chance. He was dead in the water. Peter Thiel was funding his campaign, right. was like, no more money. They needed a Trump endorsement. Trump didn't want to give him an endorsement. He really needed the help of Donald Trump Jr. and his allies to push Trump, uh, Tucker Carlson as well, to push Trump to give him an endorsement just two years ago. Now, he's been working on him for a very long time. We know that J.D. Vance is a smart operator. You know, he's worked in um, Silicon Valley yeah. and uh, able to raise money, obviously. And he was able to win Donald Trump over in a matter of years. But there were a lot of people in Trump's ear saying, this is your guy. You have Tucker Carlson, you have Don Jr. And then you also had Rupert Murdoch saying anyone but J.D. Vance and Trump and Rupert Murdoch do not have a great relationship. So that doesn't help, you know, the, the cause against J.D. So, you know, I think right now the party's just rallied around him and, and yeah. with him and all the naysayers are just going to have to get behind. In, in years back, the power brokers in the Republican Party had nice suits and big wallets. And and now it, I, you say names like Elon Musk, you say names like Peter Thiel. Mm -hmm. there, there are podcasters. Tucker Carlson was up on stage right. with the former president and J.D. Vance on the day that J.D. Vance got announced. Are the new power brokers in the Republican Party that group? Yes, I would say so. I mean, they're not even, they're, they're influencers. They are MAGA influencers. They have their own podcasts. They have their own orchestra. They have their own constituencies. Tucker Carlson probably has more power than any of these people standing up there. Um, that's why people talked about him for vice president. Um, and, and, you know, J.D., it's interesting because I know that in the beginning, Trump was a, a afraid of passing on the mantle, the MAGA mantle that he created onto someone so young. Um, he doesn't have much, like, he doesn't think much about legacy and what that means yeah. but something made him come along and decide okay i can get around the idea of passing this on to him because the truth is on day one jd is going to be running for 2028 and that means he's gonna have to take some tough calls is he gonna go along with trump on everything or is he going to think about his own political future mark you know about this what's in store for senator jd vance over the next few months and having to be <laughs> donald trump's number two because that's not an easy job no i mean you're literally you were picked yesterday and you are delivering a speech in front of this audience, but also to the millions that are watching at home that you were probably handed by another speechwriter yesterday 
you're now going to have to rewrite it, re-edit it, put it into your own voice. You don't think J.D. Vance wrote a speech, an acceptance uh, maybe, speech? Maybe he the did. The great hillbilly elegy uh, memoir writer. Uh, but, you know, traditionally the campaign's going to have a right. speech writer give you a draft. You're going to mm -hmm. make it your own. But then you've also got to prepare for a debate. You also have to remember that everything you've ever said, every vote you've taken, is now being exposed. The Democrat Party is going to throw their oppo research file, you know, into the hands of all of their of the media. To, to you have to deal with all of that, and then you got to raise money. Don't make a mistake. The only thing right now for the next four months people are looking at after tonight's speech in that debate is are there any glimpses of distance between Donald Trump and J.D. Vance? What are some of the what are some of the behind the scenes things so that he's going to have to do right? Because there's been reports that uh, former President Trump didn't really like when Mike Pence wanted to pray. You know, it kind of bugged him sometimes when he would just like impromptu say, "Okay, we're going to pray about something." I mean, now that he's going to be with Trump all this time, he doesn't want to annoy him. What are some of the things you should stay away from? Well, the first thing you're going to spend the first couple of days uh, flying around doing joint rallies together while your teams are going to integrate themselves in campaign headquarters because that's really important and then you're going to start going out probably middle of next week I would anticipate you'll start going out and doing your own solo events but now all of a sudden you have a new scheduling team you have a new press team some of those team will come with you from your campaign or your official offices but you have to learn a new world and everything you do yeah. you're not just getting chased by Tara through the halls of, uh, of yeah. Capitol Hill yeah. You know, you're now surrounded by Secret Service. Every utterance, every trip, every every syllable is now greatly magnified, and any slip up yeah. is now on the biggest stage possible. Tara, what do we know about uh, the Democrats and Vice President Kamala Harris's office and that Biden Harris reelect team? Are they looking forward? Because the reporting is they're talking now. Harris and Vance are talking about a debate. Are they looking forward to that fight? I'm sure they're preparing. J.D. is very good at debate. If there's one thing about well, him. He's very good. Talk to us about that. Because in his primary races, right, he, he he sort of separated himself and then in the general race, too. Right. I mean, he's he has a way of, of communicating. He has a way of turning Trump's sort of like meat-headed kind of comments about the party. They say he can intellectual. Uh, uh, he could be intellectual, but also put out the MAGA principles. Right. I mean, it, just reading his book alone, I mean, he, it's actually like a very tender novel, uh, memoir. And, like, he's able to kind of bridge his policy into feeling. He can go into the Rust Belt. But I think at the end of the day, he's a really good speaker. And for Trump, what was very important was to see him on Fox News night after night defending him. Also defending him. Right. And so he's. I think he'll be a formidable challenger to Kamala Harris on that debate stage. And I'm sure that was a big thing for, for Donald Trump. And uh, and speaking of like things that might annoy Trump, yeah. he's going to have to keep his beard <laughs> clean shaven. <laughs> he likes Mark, great to see you guys. Yeah, I'm sure we'll job. talk throughout the week. That's going to do it for this hour of our special coverage of the Republican National Convention. I'm Tom Yamas reporting live in Milwaukee. Hallie Jackson's going to join me in just a little bit to pick up our convention uh, coverage. We're going to take a live look right now at the convention floor. The Republicans here are obviously pumped up. They are ready for a very interesting, very action-packed night that's going to include a team of rivals of people at one time didn't really care for former President Trump. They said some very nasty things, but tonight they will come here. They likely will kiss the ring. They will talk about this new ticket. It's going to be an exciting night full of surprises. Stay with us. Our coverage continues. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.